Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Laura, and welcome to the Writer Position Fix-It Show, where we discuss writing position topics and share ideas and exercises to help you or your writers. Stay tuned, because our guest today, Linda Allen, has some topics I think you're going to like. Thank you for joining us today. And if you're watching the replay, thank you so much for taking time to watch the replay as well. Co-hosting with me today is Randy Thompson. Hi there, Randy. How are you doing? Hey, Laura. It's a beautiful day in the neighborhood. Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, Randy has been coaching and certifying riding instructors for over 25 years and is a horse industry legal consultant and expert witness and the founder of Jumping Instructors Network. Thank you so much for being here with me today. Thank you. And, uh, and I am Laura, Equestrian Canada Senior Judge and Stewart and Competition Coach. And I'd like to introduce our special guest today, Linda Allen. Hi, Linda. Thank you very much for joining us today. It's great to be here. I'm very happy. Well, we're very happy to have you here as well. So Linda Allen has competed at Grand Prix level throughout the United States, Canada, and Europe, and was a member of the Nations Cup team representing the United States. She has designed show jumping courses around the world, including the 1996 Olympics Games in Atlanta, Georgia. And she continues to serve as an internationally respected judge, course designer, technical delegate, and clinician. And also is the author of the popular book that's on most jumping instructors shelves, The 101 Jumping Exercises. Thank you so much, Linda. I really appreciate you taking the time out of your schedule to join us today, and I'm really looking forward to it. So am I. I think um, I love this program, but I'm so glad that you're doing it and had fabulous people on. So it really is a big benefit to the industry, especially at this time. Yeah. The, Thank you so much. And you, you know, we do are, we are having some excellent uh, yes. people on and I'm so happy that they are able to share their information with us because it's a great, uh, great opportunity for, for everybody, I guess. Yes. You know, it's funny. I found very few really good horsemen that aren't willing to share. I think that's a, a quality of some of the best in our sport. So it was valuable for me coming up, and I love working with people now for that reason. Yes. So I yeah. want to remind everybody that we are live on Facebook Live, and uh, we are willing to have comments. If you have comment for Linda or Randy or myself, we'd love to hear what your comments and questions are. Please put it in the comments. And if you think that you know somebody who should be listening to this, please share it with them because we'd love to... Uh, have you all interact and join us today. So you're welcome to ask questions. So Randy, would you like to get things started off here? Well, let me see. I was just busy doing something else here. All right. So, let's get started. so we were so thrilled. Linda Allen has been so influential for all of us. I know in my career, when I was heavier into the hunter jumper world, her book, the 101 training exercises for horses and riders changed everything for me because there was no real system until then that we could work with. So we've got some topics we wanted to talk with that she's agreed to work with us on it. And let's start with, we've got the training pyramid for riders. Yes. Um, this came about, I, I do a lot of reading now. I love catching, you know, there's a lot of things out there that I Maybe they weren't there before as much as today, but or maybe I didn't have the time when I was on the road constantly, but I love reading. Uh, there's always been a training scale for horses that was developed the German system, and I think holds true totally. Um, I played with that, remade it just a little bit for jumping horses, uh, putting more emphasis on what the horses need for jumping. And then I came across a... Um, training pyramid for riders that was done by a uh, someone who I don't know personally, uh, Elena Wendenmark. And um, she did this training scale and I thought it was really good. Very often I ask riders in clinics, uh, riders that I don't know, you know, um, in order of importance, um, what is really important for the rider. And 
they usually start with their aids or, or their, uh, where their leg needs to be or that type of thing. And uh, I said, no, really, it starts with being able to stay on the horse. Um, the rider can't stay on the horse. It's very hard to do very much else. And so that comes back to from the very beginning, I think you want riders. Oh, I knew that would happen. Yeah, we <laughs> and we're live. <laughs> um, <laughs> it's usually Randy's phone Always. that goes off Hello. during these things. Somebody's okay. probably calling you to say, hey, you're live. <laughs> oh, no, <laughs> I doubt it. But um, <laughs> anyway, um, so, you know, riders, I think it's starting with riders that they need to be able to feel comfortable, be in balance, feel secure, um, before just on the back of the horse. And that comes very natural to some people. And for others, it's harder. It takes time. And it's not such a natural environment for them, or whatever you want to say. But, um, you know, and position, we've developed position over a lot of years now um, that is the most effective for most riders. And starts with the, you know, your base really having the secure leg because it does counter, you know, counterbalances your upper body and allows you to um, be effective with the rest of your body when you have a solid base that you can rely on. And so, and alignment is really important. Um, riders very often when they're sitting on a horse don't realize when they're crooked, sitting to the side or twisted or one way or another, not uh, aligned with both sides of their body and having a good balance both side to side and forward and back. So that to me is very, very important. The next step on the um, training scale is uh, relaxation because nothing really works, I've found in position, while the rider is very tense. They, you tend to work against yourself, you make the horse tense, um, and nothing works until you can relax enough to feel the motion of the horse um, and feel what the horse is feeling. In other words, read back uh, what you're getting in response to your riding. And so they need to be relaxed. I see riders sometimes judging everything is correct in terms of their position, uh, but they are so tense that it's not really working. Um, I always say it would be very effective for taking a picture on the drugstore horse, but they don't have drugstore horses anymore. The kind you put a quarter in to ride when you were a kid. I remember those. Yeah, so there's a few of us that do. Yeah. But, um, you know, the horse is in motion. Everything that we do on the horse um, is in motion, and that means the position is not can't be static. It has to be in motion with the horse and requires enough relaxation. Then in order to be effective as a rider, you have to understand, you know, how the horse responds to your aids. If you don't know um, how the horse is supposed to respond to your leg, how would you know how to use your leg? Exactly. So, and I think this step is skipped a little bit in some programs with riders. Um, it's like, um, you know, use your leg and then without really understanding exactly what response you should get from what degree of, of uh, pressure or the type of pressure you're using with your leg. The difference between using leg on one side versus using leg on both sides, um, being able to support with your leg and then to energize with your leg are different things. Then with that understanding, they learn to communicate. And that's where you come back to position, talked about a little in the last subject today, but um, to be able to really communicate with your horse because in the end, um, what the rider is asking of the horse is conveying to the horse is supposed to uh, come out in terms of how the horse is carrying the rider and what the rider's doing. And once the rider has a pretty good, um, ability in those four areas, that's, those are the riders that we say really have good feel. Uh, when I did this, I left feel and control. Um, it came out of the original dressage um, pyramid. And I feel like I'm going to remove the control because it sounds like you have 
you know, absolute control over your horse. Well, you do. Um, a rider with good feel does have very, very good control of their horse, but it is a <coughs> result of control of themselves. When the rider can control their aids, is very effective with their aids, does it in a natural, relaxed way, and has that balance and alignment and everything. That's the time when they can get the most out of their horse, and we call those riders riders with great feel. So, so can what happens if a rider uh, skips one of these steps? Let's say they get balanced and then they just try to become a trainer and go to the control option. Um, Does that ever happen, or, or are are these the are these kind of sometimes. natural progressing I, progressing steps that kind I of? I think they're important steps. I don't. I see the lots of riders that um, would have a puzzled look on their face looking at this because they never really. And some are very very good riders, and some uh, get this through uh, a natural feel through riding super horses. The horses, to mm -hmm. me, in the end, teach the riders more than the one on the ground yelling at them. Uh, so having uh, horses that, you know, speak back, I think teach people to have communication um, with the use of their aids. Um, I think the thing that bothers me the most is, doesn't bother me, but I mean, the thing that I think is skipping steps is when people are teaching riders without being aware of um, what their uh, students don't know or aren't comfortable with and skipping straight to, I want you to achieve uh, what a rider who has all of those has learned to that level um, is able to do. And they want to skip straight to let's go in the ring. And if right. we buy the right horse and we go in the ring enough times, we spend enough money on entry fees. Um, maybe you're going to be a very good competitor. But if they stay with it too long, don't have the right horse, their success isn't um, very lasting. I, I also like what you said there too, Linda, about how important the horse is. And this is, I think, a lot of coaches and trainers out there, they often get people who want to buy their, they get clients who exactly. want to buy their child, a, a two-year-old, so they can grow together. Yes, and, you know, we all get asked the question, you know, which is most important, the horse or the rider? And um, I think my answer is always, well, um, each part contributes to the whole. And if you're strong enough on one side, you can afford to be weaker on the other side. So if the horse is extremely well educated and very motivated to do the job, the rider needs certain skills, but certainly doesn't have to have the other skill. The same time you take an extremely talented rider can take a very green inexperienced horse and sort of hold their hand and get amazing things out of them, um, really amazing things. And um, that doesn't mean that the horse is trained or will do it for someone else. It's the performance on that day. So, um, you know, the less the rider, um, you know, becoming a, a, one of these exceptional riders that can ride the very inexperienced horse or the horse that's a, has a little quirky or a little different, uh, can adapt to various horses, it takes a lot of work and a lot of time and a lot of experience, um, you know, over time. And for a rider that doesn't want to devote that, if they want to do very much, they need a very exceptional horse. Yes. Um, so, um, and to be really competitive at a high level, um, that requires, I always say, to, to win in the best of company doesn't take 100% total, it takes 200%. So it needs 100% on the rider's part and 100% on the horse's part, and you will be extremely competitive um, against anyone. Um, so, um, but to really enjoy it, um, like I say, riders, um, that sort of leads into my next topic, which is setting goals. And um, I'm always very interested in, when I do clinics and that sort of thing, 
you know, what is the writer's goal? Is the writer's goal um, to be competitive at a certain level doing a certain thing? Um, is the writer's goal to um, go on and make a lifetime of writing and their goals, their, their ultimate achievement is set very high, but they're mm -hmm. realistic enough to set intermediate goals. Uh, so you know, how do you, how do you, as a coach trainer of people, get your writers to start to make goals? Is this something that they do on their own or is this something that as a trainer that you work in concert with your students? <laughs> I think, you know, to me, if I'm working with someone on an ongoing basis, which is very different than two or three days of clinic, um, right. where uh, I consider clinic more the idea of uh, pointing out from a new viewpoint um, the places that I think the writers need to work on. In other words, where their emphasis should be in the immediate future. If you're working with someone long term, then I, it, but I'm still interested in their goals, even if I'm going to be working with them for one or two days, because how strongly I um, emphasize some of the basics will be more in the writer that has high goals. Because the longer you go practicing bad habits, the harder it is to change them. I know that from personal experience when I was writing. You know, I spent a number of years learning how to do things, not the best way. And then it took half again longer uh, in order to change my habits in order to be more effective as a writer. What would you recommend that the professionals who are watching, what do they need to be able to do to help their writers set the goals? Because a lot of people don't really have goals. They just use whatever they're doing, right? Yeah. I, I would encourage them to think about it. And I mean, if they're the type that um, uh, a lot of adult writers are very sort of analytical, they're very um, um, oriented towards writing things down and that kind of thing. Kids, no, not so much. Uh, but I think really with kids, it, it's important as well. And I think if I was working with juniors, it's not just the child. I would like to know what the parent is expecting as well. Mm. What the uh, what is expecting? The parent. Oh, mm -hmm. parents. Yes. But, okay. Um, because I, very often the goals between the child and the parent aren't exactly in line. And you find this out. Um, kind of the hard way. And, you know, if you have a child who is very, very keen and absolutely, you know, in the, might not even be in the back of their mind, but they really take the sport seriously and for whatever reason are, have this bug that we're getting stuck with, um, you know, that we all live with. Anyone that's probably on this show knows uh, it's a very addictive, the horse board. And if you have a child who really wants to go on with it and a parent who basically says, oh, well, this is a once a week riding lesson and that'll be it for until they don't want to do it anymore. Um, that's going to be a problem because uh, it's difficult. The same way, the other way, if you have a, a child that loves to ride, loves to come to the barn, their biggest joy is being around the horses, um, horses and other horse people and just being uh, immersed in it while the parent is counting the ribbons from the championships they're supposed to win, you know, this summer. Um, that can be a problem because um, it puts pressure on everybody. And I, so I think it's clear in those situations. And um, if you have a rider who doesn't have goals for progressing too much further than they're going to go, you have someone that started riding at 45 and happens to have a very nice horse that suits them very well and they're enjoying it immensely, uh, they would like to feel in a lesson that they're learning something, but you know, pushing them the way you would push someone who has you know, extreme goals to be jumping higher and doing more and, you know, um, um, moving up the ladder in terms of what they're attempting and uh, being able to do, I, th I think they're not going to enjoy it as much. Then I think the 
um, the, you know, the instructor's position is much more should be um, how to have them get the most enjoyment out of what they're doing. Yeah, I think too, though, they that uh, instructors even doing the step-by-step thing they have to yeah. sit exactly sit yeah. down with their students and exactly. say okay exactly where yeah. these are if this is your goal if you want to win at the championships these are the horse shows we're going to have to go to and if you are fine with riding That's once right. a week recreational program right. then yeah. this is what we're going to yeah. be working on to make sure that, yeah. you're, and that you're safe and and uh, secure up there and having fun i think linda andy that is so important we there we have to find ways to keep our clients happy well, and exactly. Curious for us. Yeah. And one person isn't happy unless they're being pushed and challenged. In other words, right. the reason that they've come to a coach or an instructor is to seriously make advances in what they're doing. And they don't, you know, want to hear, well, that's fine. You know, the you know, the attitude towards different things. I'd like to say, you know, there's some things that it's worth being very perfectionistic about let your perfectionistic characteristics in you come out for certain basic things. There's other times when you can't be a perfectionist because you will never be happy and you have to be able to assume a good enough attitude. In other words, um, you know, to use the things that you've been working on and let them uh, be good enough to let you get the job done. And so um, a rider that has a big time um, ambition needs to be willing to put the work in. I always wonder, you know, our sport, um, there's more than a few people um, that will take a client and especially a client that has the means and say, set their goals for them, what you need to do, or the child that has the perfect equitation built. Um, you need to do this. And that's goals of the trainer. Um, and they, you know, if that isn't also the goal of the one doing it, um, it never really works. It might for a short time. But at some point they get frustrated either with the progress, you know, with the process. Somebody will get frustrated. It might even be the coach or it might be the student. Yeah, usually everybody. And the horse more than anything else. Right. Training horses, same thing. And what's a reasonable goal for this horse? Not that he's going to get it tomorrow with the young horse, but uh, be realistic. so I think it, it's an important thing and it's something that at some point it's better to discuss and it's also better, um, I see riders can change their goals. A, a rider who's been very, very successful, um, has won a lot, been champion a lot, done everything, they've devoted a tremendous amount of time to it, um, their life changes. Um, you know, for women, they get married, they have a child and all of a sudden, the time to be at horse shows four weeks out of every month um, isn't available anymore. And so it isn't realistic to say, well, I want to be champion and reserve champion again, like I was last year, um, because it probably isn't going to happen if they can only go find time to go one show a month. Um, but that doesn't mean you have to stop riding. You can change your direction a little bit and find different ways of staying within the sport that don't have the time requirement. Yes. So we're so, trying, uh, yeah. I'd just like to remind everybody, if you have any questions or comments yep. for Please. Linda, that would be awesome. Put it in the comments there. And I would like to, if you're just starting to tune in here, I'd mm -hmm. like to introduce our guest. Our special guest today is Linda Allen. Uh, she right is a. <laughs> What's that, Randy? She's right down there. Yeah. Uh, okay. We're trying and, to and you may see us kind of look into the camera. Then look look down here. It's not that we're not paying attention. It's 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 because our our uh, the uh, broadcast um, controls are over here, <laughs> and the camera's here for me anyway. Uh, so we do have a few comments here I'd like to share with you. Amy says, oh. Linda's such a wonderful teacher. Thank you so much, Amy, for 
for, for I and this is, she's from uh, Oldfield School, which I could highly recommend. It's a fun place to be. Great people. Uh, Kim Queener, exceptional and helpful discussions, advice, ladies. Thank you. You're welcome, Kim. We really appreciate you putting, taking the time to watch and put in the comments. We do have actually Ann was on here and she also put, uh, mm -hmm. we love Linda yeah. Allen. Can't wait for her to come back to Oldfield School. Yeah. Thank you so much and appreciate you taking the time. Robin, thank you for providing this. Linda Allen is excellent and so appreciate this format. Well, you're welcome, Robin. If you have any other questions or comments, if other people also have questions or comments, we'd love to love to hear from you. Matt, Matt. I love questions. Hey, Linda, oh, yes. good to, Hi, good to see you. Yeah, it's only been a uh, Quite a long time since we've seen each other, and but we spent a lot of time together at shows over the years. Yeah. Great hey, announcer. Da, 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 da. And Beth says, hi, Linda. Uh -huh. yeah. Jackie, if anybody has any questions, you know, if anybody any has tips questions? on helping parent goals and student go. goals align? Excellent I, question, Jackie. Yeah. Thank yeah. you so much, Jackie, for your question. Is any tips on helping parent goals and student goals align? Um, only, you know, my thing is I think um, if they think about it separately and then kind of share it, it helps um, because I've, it's been a lot of years, but I worked with a lot of young riders um, over a period of time. And I found that one of the most challenging things was um, parents having, you know, different concerns. I mean, in some cases, uh, it has a lot to do, especially, you know, with, with younger riders, uh, their ability to be able to spend time riding very often depends on their parents' ability and willingness to get them to wherever the horses are. So it's not something that you practice easily at home. Um, you kind of need to be, you know, putting the time in on the horse. And um, I think I, I remember having uh, one mother of a very, um, very interested, totally um, horse crazy um, young girl. Uh, I think she was 12, 13, not an easy age anyway. And she was just very, very um, devoted to her riding and to becoming better and spending time. And she loved every minute she was around the horses. And her mother was very much of the other that she needed to be have a well-rounded child that did a lot of different things and had plenty of time for her social life. And um, it, it was difficult. Um, and... I really had no idea, but I mean, I literally had the mother come to me at one point and ask me to tell, uh, Jan was the girl's name, um, that she wasn't that really that good a rider. So maybe, um, you know, she shouldn't get her heart set on, on riding. And um, I wasn't that much older. Um, there weren't people teaching within my area. So I was teaching long before I should have. But um, I said, no, I'm not willing to do that. I mean, um, obviously, she's not going to be riding if you don't bring her to the stable. So, you know, you're in a position to control it. But I'm not going to. She is, you know, a very good rider and, and uh, loves it. And it didn't turn out well for the whole family, actually. But um, and some of those various different situations that, you know, I've had personally and then that I've witnessed, um, you know, it's sad when someone, when I see a um, rider, you know, going out of the junior division that um, can't wait for it to end. Um, to me, that's um, that's sad because this is a sport that if you want to stay involved, you can do forever. Um, you know, different capacities. And, and there are other people who would like to ride but actually would enjoy just as much being part of a team um, with the with professional rider riding a horse and going and doing it. They, they would enjoy their time at the horse show more than being a nervous wreck, worrying about going around in, in a class on the horse and 
worrying about um, not being able to do it well. So there's so many ways to participate. And um, I think um, if we sort of owe it to the sport to encourage people to um, find the way that they get the most pleasure out of. That's exactly right. Especially that's the way to keep our clients too. Mm -hmm. All right, let's go into our next topic now. We have the importance of position to high performance oh, jumper yeah. rounds. I had one before that. And yep. if you oh, the, the nervous <laughs> rider. Oh, yeah, it's, it's, it's a short one. Yeah. All right. And um because again, I get a lot of uh, in when I do clinics around, um, you know, such a variety in the riders and the, what they bring to it. And um, this, you know, is a, a the general topic of the program is, you know, riding position, fix it. And, you know, as instructors, I think we all know that that basic security, um, balance and, and security is uh, sometimes an issue for some of the adult amateurs. In other words, um, it seems like you can put a six-year-old on just about anything, and if you turn your back and don't look the other way, and look the other way, you turn around, and probably two-thirds of them will be galloping around um, within a few minutes and finding their own balance and everything. It's um, you know. We all, as as uh, adults, are once you're big enough that you really need to have your leg in the right position and all of the rest. But uh, there's a lot of I work with a lot of young kids. Not too much in the U.S. because everyone is so um, overly cautious. But kids, um, you know, I have six and seven year old kids that have absolutely no problem galloping around on not too big a horse, although sometimes even on big horses, they have no leg whatsoever. I mean, their leg doesn't even come to the bottom of the flap of the saddle. And um, they, horse jumps long, horse jumps big, they chip in, doesn't matter what happens, they gallop around great. And um, so, and it really, they don't have enough leg to be able to put it in the right place at that age. Um, so they ride really off of balance, and um, and it's very effective. And I also see some adult amateur riders who don't have the optimum um, confirmation um, to be able to have a super effective leg. And but some of them ride extremely well. And I've worked with a number of riders who we, you would never pick out as a rider, who are very very competent. Um, jumping around a meter 30, meter 35, whatever, and doing a great job. And they don't really have the leg. I saw the, the um, uh, question about, you know, how do you teach position? And to be honest, that's the main reason that I'm happy I don't have long-term clients now, that I deal with people in clinics, because it is a long-term thing for them to um, – learn how to both use their leg and keep their leg in a good position. Um, a lot of, you know, the, the best horses for very novice riders are not horses that have much engine on their own. So they take motivation to keep them moving. Oh, I see what and you mean. so we're telling them two things at the same time. We're telling them, you know, kick him, make him go. And we're telling him, keep your heel down and don't move your leg. And, you know, if they were brave enough to think about it and say something, they'd say, how do I do those two things at the same time? And it is a problem, I think. And so I tend to work, um, I'm big on explaining. So I tend to explain to them that your leg has two functions. And one of them is to communicate with your horse and sometimes, uh, on rare occasions, you have to speak loudly and clearly for your horse to understand you. And But your leg also needs to be your base of support when you're jumping. 
So we need to make your horse, when you do use your leg, you have to get a response from your horse and you have to not settle for not getting a response. And then while he is go, continuing forward, before he slows down, you have to make sure your leg is in the right position. And it tends to get easier once they're jumping because the horses tend to keep themselves going a little bit more with the jump. I mean, the best lesson horses, um, once you're jumping, they're usually better at going forward than they are um, on the flat. So uh, Linda, uh, for this person here, can you, da, 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 it seems like I'm saying heels down and toes up and then placing their foot correctly in the stirrup every 15 yeah. seconds. seconds. Yeah. What, yeah. what, like what, I mean, that's the nature of teaching people it, how to ride, but it how is do you. A lot. Yeah, it is a lot, I think. Um, you know, if they're on a nice safe horse, um, and I guess in the U.S. today, if you have your liability insurance uh, paid up, but um, <laughs> that riding, you know, without stirrups, I think is the best way to get a better leg. And at that point, um, because they do have to physically hold their toe up, um, and that changes the position, the muscle in their leg, and uh, they can ride a much better position. They don't tend to ride their leg too far back. Um, and they don't actually even usually get it too far forward um, without irons. And so spending more time doing short periods of posting trot and, and uh, longer periods of sitting trot. Um, and then with the reminder, it it feels funny to raise your toe with your foot in the stirrup. And still with a lot of people, they get that better than push your heel down. Um, same thing with the hands. It's um, They're going to post with their hands a lot. Um, with younger kids, uh, you do feel like a broken record. Um, and other than that, um, you know, the the best way I know of is to have them ride with someone at the same time as someone that has a beautiful leg. It's very funny how they pick up, um, they develop habits from what they see and admire. And I often tell, you know, professionals that if they have students, they owe it to their students to ride in a fairly classic form because every idiosyncrasy of the professional, the riding professional will be picked up by their students. Right. It's true. And so yeah, you can, you can you know, tell which students are riding with which professionals because they seem to ride the same, time, right? Cause they watch them all the time. Like they're color coded. You can just tell. And, yeah. and I've often told, you know, very interested riders, they don't even have to ride with the person. You can tell who they are. I won't say copying, but emulating. Okay. And um, and I always say, you know, if you're going to um, aspire to ride like someone, you know, copy the things that make them successful, not the things that are their unique idiosyncrasy, because many of the t top riders are. And when you judge, you go to an area and you see all the riders with their elbows out you know the rider that's been winning the equitation rides with their elbows yeah, out. So, yeah. And it's exactly. hard to explain that they do not win because their elbows are out. They win because they're the best riders, despite the fact that their elbows are out. Right. So, you know, that in the classes they've been in, they have everything else has been uh, superior. And so you can win despite things rather than because of them. But, so I have a question for you that has come up on several of our shows, and that is the uh, posting canter that some of the people are now doing. Yeah, I mean, I I hate it. Um, it's it's. Um, <laughs> Did you say yeah. that again? But say it's slower by itself. <laughs> Brother, we hate it. <laughs> I find it um, unattractive. Me too. Um, it's it's a. It's an easy, sloppy way of getting a little bit more canter out of your horse without having to use your leg. And I think some hunter riders discovered it. 
It's a little bit like the hunter flop. You throw your arm, your hands up on the horse. Oh, that's your flop. I like that. I love that. I'm going to quote you, quote you on that. And, I'm going to um, say, Linda and Allen and calls this the hunter flop. flop. <laughs> that, um, actually, that happens in other disciplines. The cutting horse people are wonderful at flinging their body side to side um, so that it makes the horse look like he's being quicker up with the cow. Oh, but, I never thought they would be doing that, but it makes so much sense. Yeah, for me. yeah. <laughs> and, you know, and it is, it's a little bit sloppy. I see top riders riding around with their hands doing this. Right. Oh, no, I hate that. Area. That is one of my um, really. It, you go to watch the professional people in the warm-up ring, and some of them are doing that. I yeah. just can't. I don't and understand posting it. Posting straight up and down, and just a lot of things that are basically. Um, I think it's lazy, really. I mean, you're riding a bunch, and oh, I can, you know, I can ride. However, my horse will go well, and it's they get a good result no problem yeah but it isn't good for um you know producing top riders like i said if if you go to a stable where the the riders um that are kind of the top of that their group and doing the best when they have a beautiful leg you will see most of the younger riders getting a good leg um, and it seems subliminally to be more effective than the, you know, constant put your heels down and keep your toes, you know, raise right. your toes, keep your hands still, whatever, whatever. And Even, that goes, a lot of that goes to the teaching techniques that are out there. Yeah, yeah. You know, now with the new media that we have where we have access to so much thing, so much yeah. information, I think everybody's gotten watch more. Watch the right ones, you know, watch the right ones and find the things that are consistent not everyone can have a very low heel. Um, there's a very big difference between um, you have a very correct leg in that you're not pinching with your knee. Uh, your leg is directly under you and your ankle has flexion rather than resistance um, without having a low heel. Um, but other people can put their heel down, I mean, to the point where you could read a novel off of the sole of your boot uh, if you stood in front of them. Um, and But that's just a level of individual flexibility. And But the position, the thing that I like the best is to have riders alternate between posting trot and um, a half seat, two point, whatever the current best term is, um, but all weight in their leg. Um, and at that point, I really want to see the heel down that I don't want them to sit into a posting trot. I want them to sink under the front of their seat bone um, and let the horse uh, put them into posting and then go back into two point. And it's the transition between the two, not either one, that I think is the most important. And then with an advanced rider, I like to go from sitting to posting to two point back to, to posting back to sitting because being able to transition your weight uh, from sitting with only the weight of your leg in your stirrup, um, the weight of your upper body softly in the saddle and being able to follow the trot um, and then to shift enough weight into your lower leg for the posting trot and then to be able to shift all of it to be able to maintain a position just out of the saddle. I mean, very close. To me, a, um, a half seat, a two point is not correct when the rider is a mile out of the saddle. Exactly. And I don't mind them using um, the horse's neck um, through the whole thing at the beginning. In other words, to balance, help them find a, a stable position with their upper body. I don't have a problem, but I don't want to see them pick the hands up when they pick up the posting trot. So right. just going back and forth, back and forth, they'll sometimes say post four times, sit for four beats, or post four, stay up for four. 
That sound oh, familiar, yeah. Andy? Yep, yep, yep. We, we, we talk about this. I, I, I call this the up, up, down exercise. So That's, yep. You do your kind of two-point position in yep, uh, exactly. for well, two or three yep. or four and then down for a couple. So there yep. is a question here from Colleen McCormack Peterson. Mm -hmm. Who would you recommend our riders should be watching and emulating? With YouTube, they can pretty much watch anybody and I'd love to share which one. Oh, um, BZ Madden, uh, Rodrigo Pessoa, um, McLean, although he, he is, uh, he's an incredibly good rider, um, and really has worked a lot on his position, but he doesn't have a long leg, but he's really, you learn to use his leg extremely effectively. Um, and for very tall riders, uh, find lots of um, Ian Miller. Can't um, go wrong with Ian Miller. No, exactly. Or Jonathan. They, they, you know, they're best to me. Beezy is the best because she's not extreme in any direction. She doesn't have a very long leg, but she, you know, it's she's very, very effective, and it's always soft, always invisible. And she's one of the riders like McLean, Rodrigo you never see them riding around sloppy. It's just not part of their personality. I mean, if, you know, you could look at her over the biggest jump or packing around and trotting an X and her basic riding is classic and correct. And um, the same Excellent. with the other riders that Mentioned. Excellent advice. So um, I don't mean to cut you off there, but oh. Anne has a question too. The move between low children jumpers and high is always seemingly big deal for ambitious kids. Suggest exercises for that period of their lives. You know, really, um, when you talk six inches difference, which is kind of what you're, you know, in three inches would consider a big deal, really isn't much. Um, it's a little more fold up for the horse's legs, a little more push off off the ground in terms of being able to execute it. To me, the hardest part is um, that mistakes, weak points that you get away with all day long when the jumps are a little lower and the horse is happy, you know, going around knows that it doesn't have to be just right. Uh, all of a sudden create noticeable errors when you move up. So that's the difference. Um, the two things for me is I really, I know I'm in trouble when I do a clinic and a rider tells me, well, I'm jumping two foot three, but I'm not ready for two foot six yet because they are fixated on the height of the jump. Uh, so the other comment that is really, I know I'm gonna have a long weekend is the one that says, well, uh, I'm really good when I see my distance. And when I don't see my distance, I'm not good. I know I'm in trouble there. Um, you don't see a distance at two foot six. Um, there really is no such thing. Um, but anyway, um, the two things that I like to do is with a rider, I like them to be aware of the, you know, if they're doing like a course, okay, how much of that course would it have been fine if the jumps were bigger? In other words, what jumps did you have that might have been not so good if the jumps had been bigger? Um, same thing schooling. Was that good enough or would that have been a problem? If you got a little bit ahead of the small jump, that would turn into a bad chip if the jump was a little bigger. So even to the point of going over poles on the ground, did you lose your balance back a little bit? Did you sit a little bit when the horse took a long step? Uh, were you a little ahead of the horse when he shortened his step over the pole? Being aware of that. Um, and then later jumping, going, okay, if I put it up, you do it the same way. Because the whole point is riding lower jumps correctly enough that when you put the jumps bigger, um, you've already practiced. Uh, probably some of the best advice I got years ago, because I was a rider that was very nervous rider originally about the size of the jumps. Um, and great trainer, Jane Lewis said, 
if you ride every three foot jump like it's five feet high, you won't have any problem with five foot. And I found that to be really true. In other words, so I needed to know whether my imaginary five foot fence would have been successful or not successful. Um, and then it was absolutely true. Absolutely true. Uh, the other thing that's really excellent yeah. ad advice here. We do have a, okay. So Beth says, uh, I think she was talking about your, your up, uh, your oh, two point sitting yeah. rising trot exercise yeah. that she really liked. It's, and Mary it tells you, yeah, if your leg is in the right position, it's easy. If your leg goes too far back, um, it becomes very hard to, to sit. If your leg goes too far forward, um, you're bracing it forward, and then trying to get into two point becomes impossible. Right. So, and they so lose time in their riding position. They there's a, another great question here from Mary. Thank you mm -hmm. so much, Mary, for asking this question. Yeah. Following up on Anne's question, but from the horse's perspective, just moved a horse up to the meter 35 and he got very nervous. He previously competed very successfully at meter 25. Thoughts to help the horse get more comfortable? That's a great question. Thank you so much, Mary. And it's been not, and of it's been horse, it's horse and rider. And whether you're talking going from 125 to 135 or you're talking going from two foot three to two foot six is really the same thing. In other words, don't get fixated on exactly what height. When you're at a horse show, the course designer is going to build the majority of the jumps at a given height. Um, but schooling, uh, school all around that height. Um, and on any real jump school, um, some of the jumps, if, if you're going to go and show at 135, you should be jumping more than, you know, occasionally, uh, a jump at a meter 45, um, so that the horse looks at the jump, um, not with, oh, that's my height. I know what to do with it. And, oh, that one is bigger than I'm used to looking at but instead looks at all of them, whether they're tiny or big, as, okay, I didn't need to figure out how to jump this one. Okay, what's it take to jump this one? And the same thing with riders. Now, you can set it up. Uh, the person on the ground or the, the rider who's also the trainer has to set it up for getting success every time on the bigger jumps. So you don't want it to be in the worst position or the hardest to get to or the most difficult or whatever, but um, set up significantly more um, in the opinion of the rider or the horse um, uh, as part of your routine. So when you're going, you're going to jump lots of little ones. Be very particular about being precise. Notice every little jump to the corner, anything like that. And then put some jumps in that look big, okay? But make sure that those are ones that they will jump well. And I, you know, I think when you do that and the horse feels more and more comfortable um, where the height you're going to show at is sort of in between easy and hard, you know, extra hard. Uh, that's a time when they're ready to show at that medium height because now they have to go all the way around. Right. Excellent. That's good. So, uh, so no specific exercises that they can do or they are these, uh, Mary, are you looking for, uh, like a gymnastic type exercise or schooling type you know, exercise? On that, my, my favorite thing to do is to set up like a line of three. Um, could be on three strides and three strides. It could be on two, um, sometimes one and one. Um, but I will raise or spread one jump out of the three um, and significantly more than the others. So maybe at the beginning, your jump going in is quite easy, and then you have a bigger jump with an easy jump going out. Um, and I won't do it only one time. 
So I will do it once that way and then change it. So the next time the one going in is more imposing and but the next two are quite simple. Um, the width that Mary's question I'm seeing there, most afraid by the width. Um, the biggest problem I find with jumpers in moving up, uh, especially if you're moving from one ring to the next. So you get the small classes in one arena and then you, at the point you move into the main arena, you get a full-time course designer generally. And the full-time course designer is paying attention to width as well as height. The one who's doing a bunch of rings, um, the crew never changes width unless the course designer is there. Um, and if they do, very often they do it too much. So we don't push them too hard on that. So the biggest change when you say, okay, you've been doing the meter 20 and it's been going around fine and then you're going to move to the 130 uh, and the 130 goes in the other ring. The problem is the jumps will be proportionate, correctly proportionate in width in the 130 where they probably weren't in the 120. Plus it's a little more imposing atmosphere and the jumps are more um, impressive. So you've changed three things at the same time. Um, I, um, I had a little experience with moving horses. We were developing up with riders that hadn't jumped it too far. Sometimes if I was moving a horse up, um, I would tell the rider that it was okay, go in um, and jump as far as the horse is comfortable. And if you feel like you're going to have to go all out into chasing driving mode in order to complete the course, just pick an easy jump, jump it and retire. And that's okay. And the amazing part is without the pressure, the riders tended to go the whole way. And most of the time the horses were ready and they were okay. The other thing is when you're moving horses in particular, but also a more timid rider, don't force them to stay in at that level. So, so you're saying if, if they're not comfortable there, drop them down, back down? Up and down. So if you feel like the horse went in, the like Mary's horse went in the 135 class, felt tense and nervous and like it was a little bit over impressed, drop it down, give it a fun 120 class, Go in, have a good time. Horse feels good. Go in, pick another one. The other is pick a time first round class. That won't be as hard as a jump off class to move up because the course designer isn't worried about too many getting in the jump off. Thank you so much. So we are uh, two minutes left here. If oh, anybody has okay. any other comments or questions yes. here. Because the only comment on my last topic was, that, you know, the one on um, the important, important position for yeah. a real high performance rider. Yeah. The more you expect to get, the more you need. There are riders with terrible position who are very, very successful riders, but they are the extreme exception. They are like the horse that does everything wrong, but can win over very big jumps. And they exist also. Um, but they happen to be um, totally um, unique. They have extreme ability to be able to convey what they want to the horse, riders that do everything wrong. They have extreme um, uh, balance and, and just general feel for being in the right place at the right time. They're also very consistent with their incorrect riding. Um, it's they do the same thing all the time and no one that isn't at that level should aspire to become one of those riders. Um, it makes no sense because the vast majority that do that ride in, you know, unconventional position uh, ride terribly. So it's much better to, um, work on riding and you know classic position gives gives you the best communication with the horse so the better your position the more of a conversation the, the more clearly your horse understands and can do what you want and the more you work together instead of against each other 
So we do have a couple of questions here again. Uh, thank you so much, Linda. Kim says, how important is it to hack a horse out of the rings up and down hill work? Those are two questions. Oh, um, I feel sorry for horses whose entire life consists of living in a cell mm -hmm. and uh, making the huge walk to the grooming area and then being gotten on and ridden in the same circle all the time. I mean, I think um, mentally, um, the horses, they, I call it a slave mentality. They have to be, you know, willing to accept and go along with it, make the best of it and go along. Um, that mentality in a high performance horse isn't going to create winning. So the more variety you can put in, the better. Um, I feel sorry for the riders that do that. The hill work is if you don't have hills, you can't do hill work. Um, but if you have the ability to ride out, it certainly is wonderful. I mean, think of it as, um, you know, a day off of work um, for, uh, you know, a working person that goes to the same cubicle every day um, needs that vacation. They need that free day every once in a while for mental health and the horses do too. Excellent. Yes, I, I totally agree with you on that. Hacking is important. Really? It kind of is like a refresher for them, isn't it? Not, yeah, not yeah. always going into the ring exactly. or going it's like going yeah, into yeah. a school to do same, your classes sit, at sit school. Sit at the same desk for how many hours and then yeah. go and sit in your yeah, room exactly. all day. I mean, those are very confining. And so uh, here's, our, here's our last question, Linda, <laughs> then we're going to have to sign off here. Yeah. Can you repeat? what the up, up, down exercise is. <laughs> You're up. I, I just refer to it as alternating between a half seat and a posting trot for, for the novice rider. I don't want them to stay in either for too long. I like them to change back and forth, back and forth. And what I'm looking for and wanting them to feel is how easily and naturally they can get from one to the other. It should be just thinking it, that it should be um, oh, the same as moving your chewing gum from one side of your mouth to the other. It's just not a big thing. And being able to repeat it often enough, um, like I say, with a rider that has, a, an advanced rider that has a sitting trot, um, then I prefer, then I add in the sitting. And um, so they do that. And for sitting trot, I don't like to have them try to keep sitting beyond the point where they're bouncing right. because I don't think they can go back. So I like to do walk to sitting trot, allow them to post at the point that they're going to bounce and then come back and walk and do sitting trot and see, just make it a challenge. How far can you go before you have to post? Um, and I think that works better. Well, there you go, Catherine. Thank you so much. Okay, well, we're going to sign off for now. Thank you so much, Linda. Our guest today was Linda. Thank you, everyone, for coming on. I saw some um, familiar names that I haven't seen in too long, so hopefully we'll get back to normal and get together. Yeah, it's a great way to network with people yeah. here, isn't it? Uh, so I'd like to thank Linda Allen. She's our was our guest today. Thank you, Randy. And uh, Randy, what's the summary for Friday? We have another show on Friday. What's oh, yes. Yeah. So this is somebody that Linda knows, too. We have Susan Harris from Centered Riding that'll be coming in here. She does, most of us know her from Centered Riding. She does the Anatomy of Motion. Oh, she's an artist. She's fabulous. she's fabulous. And she's done a whole thing now where she's working on her specialty is working with jumping position and showing people how to use it. So Susan Harris is going to be on our show Friday and we'd love to see you come in. Yep. You can ask oh, her. Yes. I'm going to do my very best to be there. I am one thing in the morning, but I should be done by then. So awesome. Well, I'll send you a link so you can have it. I have to thank her again. She did the uh, diagrams for and drawings. Yeah, she was for telling my us account, today. So she did so very kindly. Yeah. I'm yeah. wondering if she's watching. Uh, yeah, so Monday that's... We have, the, uh, Monday we have the Jay Duke show, and he's going to be this next uh, Monday. He's going to have Carl Cook, 
And he's going to be talking about the fascinating life of U.S. team writer Carl Cook. Join me on an inside look on the incredible journey of the Southern California Grand Prix star and his rise to frame. He will be fascinating. He will be really good. Great guy. Hello from Guatemala. Oh, oh. Wow. Thank oh. you. Oh, okay. Nice. Super, Excellent. super. I super can't wait yeah. to back there. I used to, before this started, I was going every couple of months and I haven't been able to go and I can't wait. It's a great place. Super people. Yes, I bet. Great weather too, I bet. Mm -hmm. uh, so thank you so much and go use this stuff. Yeah. Go yeah. use this stuff. Right. What do you like to say, Randy? We'll see you on the other side of the fence. Okay. <laughs> thank <laughs> you. Line. See you at the finish line. Exactly. Great. See you at the finish line. That's yep. Linda's. Okay. Thank you. Bye. Okay. Bye-bye.